Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Good morning. Yeah, I'd like us for you guys to stand this morning. Kindly rise on your feet as we start the service this morning. Today we are privileged to have the the youth leaders. Yes. <laughs> so kindly say hi to your neighbor as we're starting the service. Just say hi to your neighbor and smile. Smile. Belongs to you alone. You 
Divine and everlasting Father, we come before you this wonderful morning. Indeed, all glory belongs to you alone. You are the only one who deserves our praise, our worship this morning. And dear Lord, even as you are gathered here this morning, I pray that you will accept our worship. I pray that you will accept our praise this morning. May you forgive us for whatever deeds that we have done against your will. I pray that you'll be with the ones who are yet to join us this morning. And it is in Jesus' name I do trust with you. I pray, amen. 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 Hi, church. Hi. I hope you're happy this Easter morning. Yep. Kindly say hi to your neighbor. Kindly say hi to your neighbor. So the next song we are going to say, Jesus, we adore you. I think really we do really adore Jesus, right? Yeah, he died for us. Now he has risen for us, right? around 2,000 and years ago, approximately, is when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ resurrected. And I believe that's a reason to be happy this morning, to celebrate. I want us to clap for the Lord this morning and just appreciate the fact that he loved us so much that he was able to die on the cross for our sins. So I want us to sing and shout to the Lord this morning, having that testimony. Because that's what he made to let our church. Ama. Amen, amen. Let's clap.
time of worship be open to receiving from the Lord even as we praise him and adore him. Amen.
church in that same mood of worship, may we just take a minute or two and uh, pray. Just lift up your thanksgiving this morning and uh, thank, thank the Lord for what he's done in your life. up your praises, lift up your worship this morning, lift up all your requests and your thanksgiving this morning. Thank the Lord for what he's done in your life. Thank him that he's risen, we are here because he's risen. He's risen in our lives, he's risen in our families risen in our workplaces, in our country. It's because of him we're able to walk, we're able to, to wake up in the morning, we're able to face the challenges of the day. He's the energy, he's the one who drives us each and every week, each and every month, every year. It's because of his life, his risen life. His act of love was, was what saved us. It's not because of any, anything we did, but it's His grace. It's His love, the love He's given us freely. Freely. We don't deserve it. But here we are. We are loved. And we're able to love others because of Him. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you this morning. We are, we are grateful for, for this Resurrection Sunday. We, it's because of you, Lord, we live. We were once dead, but once you, we accepted you, Lord, we have new life in you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving us good health, allowing us to be here that those who wanted to see this day, but they're not here, Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for, for all that you do. Lord, for those of us who are waiting for you, waiting upon you, Lord, we continue to wait upon you and to, to call out your name and ask you to, to meet us at our points of need. May you pour out your spirit, Lord, and work in the situations in our lives, in our families, in our own lives, be it strongholds in our lives, addictions, or any challenges we have. We invite you, Lord, to, to meet us, Lord, because you're risen. You defeated death, Lord, and you're more than capable, Lord, to meet us. Lord, may you be with us as we begin our service. 
may, we, may you open our hearts, may we be receptive to your word, and may we walk out of here, Lord, as ambassadors and just representatives of your word, Lord. And may we love, help us to love as you loved us, Lord. This is our prayer, Lord. Trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's clap for the worship team. You can have your seats. <clears throat> Welcome, church. Are we happy to be in the presence of the Lord? If, if you're able to just wave at your neighbor and uh, greet them. Welcome to our service this morning. Uh, it's a youth-led service, if you haven't noticed yet. And we are, we are happy to be, to be here today. Um, I think we also have our high schoolers among us, and we, we acknowledge your presence. For those who have closed, welcome back. For those who are yet to come, we look forward to seeing you. Uh, are there any first-time visitors among us? First-time visitors. Uh, let's clap for her. Uh, kindly just introduce yourself and uh, greet the church. Happy Easter of you. Uh, my name is the Rosemary Tarangui. I'm a visitor here following my daughter, who is a four of the church. Me, I'm a Catholic. So it's my first time I sent, because there is no Catholic near where they reside, I decided to follow her because we all for one Jesus Christ, all of us. Yes. Praise the Lord. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Any other visitor amongst us? Okay, thank you. Uh, we also acknowledge our online viewers. We thank you for joining us today. Uh, I think at this moment we can have the media highlights. Welcome to Nairobi Baptist Church on Gatarongai. The notices are as follows. Our vision is Christ-centered church, strong families, and transformed nations. Our mission statement is a worshiping community of the Lord Jesus Christ that is advancing the kingdom of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Friday prayers continue every Friday at 7 p.m via the Zoom platform. Please log in for prayers and present your needs before the Lord. The Kyugu family are graciously inviting you for a Thanksgiving fellowship on the 6th of April at their home. Come and join the family as they express their gratitude to God for the healing of their daughter, Makena. Please confirm your availability by getting in touch with us through the church line. 318 Leadership Training kicks off in the month of May. Register at the information desk to secure a place. Seniors Fellowship Meeting will be on the 6th of April from 9 a.m. at the church compound. All seniors are encouraged to attend. Baptism classes for high schoolers begins in April. Any teenager who is in high school and would like to be baptized should register immediately. The Walk for Classrooms to raise funds to complete the Sunday School building will be on the 8th of June. Registration for the walk will commence soon. Be part of this noble cause and start preparing. Watch this space for more details. There will be a couples retreat in Mombasa from the 18th 
to the 21st of October. Few slots are remaining. So if you want to relax and fellowship Chini Amnazi, register now. Treat your spouse. Charges are only 35,000 shillings per couple, which is inclusive of accommodation, meals, SGR transport. Deposit 5,000 shillings to secure your slot for the retreat at the information desk. Register now. Are you in a come we stay marriage and you would like to summarize your marriage? Please register at the information desk. NBC Ongatarungai is the place to be for prayers, worship, and fellowship. For more information about NBC Ongatarungai, call 0700-753-759 or send an email to rongai at narobibaptist.co.ke Thank you for joining us today. Do have a blessed week. Praise the Lord Church. I hope that we have all been soldiering in reading the Gospels. Today we turn to the book of Luke, um, which we see Luke narrating the history of salvation. Unique to this Gospel is that Luke is most probably the only Gentile author of the New Testament. He protests Jesus as the Savior of the world. In chapter 1, we see uh, Luke introducing the book saying that he is writing to a man called Theophilus. Luke begins the, his narration with the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist to Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth. The angel Gabriel also visits Mary and, 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 and informs her that he's going to conceive the Savior of the world. In chapter 2, we see Jesus is born in Bethlehem and this birth is announced to the shepherds. The baby is presented to the temple and what is remarkable is that Simeon and uh, Anna, a prophetess, both recognize Jesus as the Savior and the, way, the, the, the awaited Messiah. In chapter 3, the ministry of John the Baptist precedes his public life. John the Baptist begins his ministry, preaching repentance and baptizing people in preparation of the coming Messiah. In chapter 4, we see that Jesus is tempted and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he is able to overcome the temptations through the word of the Lord. In chapter 5, we see that Jesus calls his first disciples, he performs miracles, he heals the lepers, the paralyzed man, and dines with sinners, even tax collectors. In chapter 6, Jesus engages in several controversies with the Pharisees regarding the Sabbath observance. He selects his 12 apostles and delivers the sermon on the plain. I will only highlight three lessons, though there are so many lessons that can be gotten from this chapter. Number one is repentance and forgiveness. Number two is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And number three is prayer. Bottom line is found in chapter 1, verse 37. For there is nothing that is impossible with God. What you think is impossible with God is is impossible with God is quite possible. So let us repent so that we might obtain mercy from God. Let us desire the infilling of the Holy Spirit so that we can be revived with fire. Let us continue praying like Jesus did so that at his word, at his word, we can act by faith according to his perfect will. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is uh, Joseph Tingaida Musumba. My uh, experience with uh, the 318 training was really great and very timely. Uh, having joined uh, the church, in Nairo Baptist Church, uh, I think about uh, six or eight months uh, before the training started, uh, the training uh, acted as a, a real key um, on my journey. Um, or in my journey with Christ within this community of uh, Nairobi Baptist Church on Gatabungai. It's sharing a common doctrine um, of the Word of God. Um, doctrine and then sharing the activities that we undertake 
you know, to grow and become all that God wants us to, to become and also continue to share with the purpose of uh, expansion of the kingdom of God. My name is Regina Kendi. I fellowship here at Nairobi Baptist Church Westlands and I was privileged to attend the 318 Discipleship Program. And one of the things that was standing out for me was um, learning about discipleship and evangelism. And we got a chance to know that it is not about waiting for opportunities to come our way. But 318 challenged me that I actually need to go out of my way to look for these opportunities. And some of the ways that we did that was by taking advantage of the surroundings and the people around us. For example, evangelizing to the person sitting next to me in a matatu, or even talking to a security guard in the neighborhood, um, or even talking to my house manager. Whenever a nation is faced with war, it prepares in every way possible, and nothing is left to chance. The army, those who move along the ground, strengthen their positions, strengthen their abilities, prepare their equipment. Likewise with the Air Force, likewise with the Navy. All the boundaries, all the borders are strengthened. All the personnel are made ready for that war. We see a similar thing in Genesis 14, from 14 to 16, when Abraham was preparing to rescue Lot after he and many others had been carried off by the enemy. And Abraham called up 318 trained men to go and help him to accomplish this mission. Abraham's model of preparedness is what has inspired Nairobi Baptist Church to build the capacity of ministry leaders for this mission to which God has called us. And so 2024 is our third season, our third year of running the 318 Leadership Development Program. Through this program, we are committed to develop leaders at every level of our church for the ministry today and the ministry of tomorrow. This program for 318 is structured in such a way that it prepares and equips the participants to understand and to be grounded in Bible doctrine, in discipleship and evangelism, and in missions and church planting. And so to this end, we have this season of training that runs in three segments uh, in the middle of the year, right until the end of September. And so this year we want to invite those who have yet to be trained in this program to please register with your church admin or with the person who is in charge of registration for the 318 training program. Register immediately after the church service we will be in touch with the dates and everything else that you need to know before the training starts. The Lord bless you. Thank you, Mr. Tim. Uh, we shall have a recitation by Sharon Diana. You can come up. Scripture of the week uh, is from the book of Luke 6 35, NIV version. And it says, uh, But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back, because uh, the reward will be great, and our reward will be great, and we'll be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Let's clap for her again. Um, we have a presentation by our youth, I think, dancers. I think they can come up. May I kindly request for this? Okay.
Oui, Média, oui. Yeah. Good morning, church. In front of you is the NBC dancers. We have a dance. I hope you will enjoy. Father, we pray for these children as they go for their Sunday school classes. We thank you for them. May you be with them. May you, uh, may they learn your word and may they grow in you, Lord. And may they choose you, Lord, when they come of age. This is our prayer. Trust in and believe in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We shall have our time of offertory, so if the music team can come. Our pay bill number is 498-458, account offering. If you have physical money, we have our boxes at the front here. Yeah.
deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns His face away as wounds which mark the chosen one. Bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that I in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an but this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom How deep, How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mark the chosen one. Bring many sons to glory. Thank you. Okay, um, it's time for the word church. Let us turn to John chapter 20, verses 1 to 23. The empty tomb. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples start, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped round Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. 
they still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he has said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Um, we shall welcome the preacher of the day. Yeah. Let's pray for him. Dear God, we thank you for again for this wonderful Sunday. We'd like to pray for our preacher of the day. May you be with him. May you speak to us through him. And may, may our hearts be open, Lord, and be receptive to your message today. This is our prayer, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's clap again for him. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you uh, for even for coming today. It's an honor to be here. Um, I think one of the beautiful things about being away for a while is that when you come and see progress, seeing our youth lead us so well, haven't they led us well? Um, and I think even more powerful is the fact that they're using their gifts in church, because I know for many of us, we know how out there um, people are using their gifts for, very, for various reasons uh, that are not of the Lord. And the fact that they use them so well, it's, it's quite a wonderful testament. So maybe, can we, can we give a clap to the youth? Yeah. Okay. To fellowship here at Rongai, but I've not been here for a while. Um, so I come once in a while. Um, this, is, this is my home, so it's always a pleasure to be here and to be invited as well. Uh, again, as I'd mentioned uh, once before, the fact that I can be invited is quite a good thing. So in case you don't see me around, it's, yeah, I am away. So um, we have an interesting story with us today, an interesting piece of scripture that has, has, has been read to us. Uh, and maybe uh, let, me, let me start with, a, with just a story of a friend. Now, normally when we say I, I have a friend, we assume that the story is about me. I assure you that the story is not about me. So as I, as I tell you the story, please do not think that it is me. Um, so we, I have this friend, um, and I'll call him Peter. Let me call him Peter. Now, this is a true story. It's not, it's not a fake story. It's a true story. Um, so we'll call him Peter. Uh, and Peter uh, has, is, is working, and he has a colleague. Let's call her Elizabeth. Um, and so they've been working for a while, Wamezuana, they're familiar with each other, and so of course the assumption is that, you know, they're friends, they can tell each other anything. 
Um, so, and this is how Peter told us the story, by the way. Um, so, one day Elizabeth comes to work, um, and she's dressed very fancily. The way Peter described it is she's dressed as if she's wearing, you know, those Disney princess dresses that are very wide and flowery and, and just, and poofy. His exact word was, the dress was poofy. So, um, there's a way that the dress, again, in his description, there's a way that the dress around here and around the waist kind of flares out and kind of puffs out. Again, his words, poofy. And so Peter, assuming that him and Elizabeth are very close and are very familiar with one another, comments to Elizabeth, hey, you look very good today, but that dress makes you look pregnant. <laughs> and now, uh, of course, hell, hell hath no fury, like a woman's scorned. So you can imagine the responses that Peter, Peter got and Peter was uh, received. Um, now, I know I can imagine the ladies here thinking, oh my word, if someone told me that. <laughs> Now, why do I share this? I share this because in Peter's defense, his assumption was, I am familiar with Elizabeth. I can share with her. I can tell her things. Uh, you know, and, and, and familiarity is very dangerous. And as we approach this story of, of, of Easter, you know, one of the challenges we have is we become so familiar with this story that it loses its potency. It loses its power because we assume we know what new thing is there for us to learn. Um, and it's quite dangerous because then we don't explore scripture, we don't meditate on it, we don't think through things. Uh, so yes, familiarity is dangerous. So I'd encourage us, not just through today's sermon, but even as we go through our day to day, that we would think through these scriptures, we would think through some of these things that are happening, that we would not allow comfort and familiarity to settle in, that we, we assume we know. And as we approach God's things, not just today's sermon and not just today's scripture, but throughout our lives, we would not allow that familiarity to become very common and, and, and just mess us up. So a bit of background on our passage and our scripture today. Um, I, if you are here on Friday, I, I watched online, I wasn't here, but Pastor Koti had given us a timeline of the events of crucifixion. So what had happened is on Thursday evening, Christ had been arrested um, and then throughout the night until uh, Friday morning, there was a trial. And then at around 9, 9 a.m. in the morning is when he was crucified, and about 3 p.m. is when he actually died. So it had been quite an ordeal um, throughout, not just for him, but his disciples and his followers as well. So on the Sabbath day for the Jews at that time, and even now, is, is, was Saturday. And so they rested on Saturday, and now there's a group of now people who went to the tomb on Sunday morning with the intent of going to see the body um, and anoint it with, with oils. So we meet, in our passage today, we meet the disciples and Jesus' followers in a state of grief. So not only has their teacher, their master, their leader, their friend been killed, he's been, he's been murdered in a way that's very horrific. You know, it's been made into a spectacle. So you can imagine that all the things that are going through their minds because of what has happened, and also that this has happened in a very short time. Um, I mean, just previously, Jesus has been welcomed in, and then it's like everything has been flipped around. Uh, so he's been crucified, and they're in this state of grief, they're in this state of hopelessness. And remember again, for these guys, they weren't, uh, they didn't understand all that Jesus had been talking about. So it's not like they're looking forward to him resurrecting. Um, they're not looking forward to him coming back. For them, it's, it's this powerful man, this close friend of ours is gone. And what do we do now? They have given their lives over to him. Um, they've, they've left if it's families, if it's work, if it's their careers. And now he's no more. He's gone. So what do we do? How, what happens? On top of the grief that they're facing and that they're going through. So the title of our sermon today is Giving uh, the Spirit and Peace. And because the Spirit goes hand in hand with peace, what we'll focus on today is uh, this peace that Christ talks about. Um, and in light of that, we'll have four points, four things that I'd want us to look at. One is the peace that God offers. Second is what seeking that peace looks like. Third is what keeps us from that peace. And finally, fourth, what only God can give us is peace. So again, let me just um, reiterate them for those of us who may be taking notes. One is the peace that God offers. Two is what seeking that peace looks like. Three is what keeps us from that peace. Four is only God can give us this peace. 
So on to our first point, the peace that God offers. And I'd want us to just define what this peace is, what it is, what it isn't, so that we have a better understanding as we go through the scripture. Um, now, John, if, you, if, you, if you've read through the book of John, he doesn't write things chronologically necessarily. And so inspired by that, we will also be inspired by him. So John wrote this book so that the readers uh, will believe that Jesus is the son of God and that we would believe in him, yeah? So for those two points. So everything he includes and everything he excludes is towards that effect, that, towards that very purpose. And he's very concise and very direct in what he does. That's why, again, he doesn't follow a chronological um, uh, you know, timeline of what happened to Jesus, but rather he, he, he focuses more on events and things that happened uh, that are significant. So it's very significant that the very first thing that Jesus says to his disciples after he appears to them is, peace be with you. And not only that, but he says it twice. So there's, there's, there's quite a lot of weight to that, to that fact. I mean, he's been dead, he's resurrected, these guys are in the state that they're in, and the first thing that he says is, peace be with you. Um, and just maybe again, as a, maybe just as a thought experiment, you know, have, what comes to your mind when you hear peace? Um, you know, what, what actually goes through your mind? And, and I would, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have certain um, ideas already of when we hear the word peace. Uh, so most likely when we hear about peace, we think of a lack of conflict. There's no war, no violence, um, everything is working well. So if it's your career, for example, maybe you know, things are going well, the promotions, the, the, you know, the, the relationships with people within your, within your workplace, everything is going quite well. If you think of your family, there's stability, you know, your children or your parents are doing okay, they're doing well, um, there's progression and everything is, is working well towards one, one wonderful purpose. Um, just life without any dramas, without any issues. But if you notice, actually, the lives of the disciples got much, much, much worse after the transformation f uh, by Jesus from a world's point of view. So, first of all, they were all martyred apart from John. And even for John, it was not that he kind of escaped. It was, they tried to martyr him. He was, he was boiled in oil, but he survived. And so he was eventually banished to the island of Patmos where he, he wrote the book of Revelation. So you can kind of start to get a sense of what kind of lives they live. So even, even before death, they were constantly being persecuted. So the, the peace that Christ is speaking of is, is not necessarily the peace as we would immediately think about it. So I just wanted to first of all remove that misconception of what we think about when Christ mentions peace. So the peace that Christ is talking about here means a state of wholeness, a state of everything being as they should be, uh, as they originally made. Um, now everything working together, things being proper, things being joined together as a whole. So that in itself may not give us a lot of clarity, so let's continue to, to give a better definition of what this piece is, is that talk, Christ talks about. So another odd thing that Christ does is he breathes on them, um, which it's, it's very weird. But the picture that should come into our mind when we see this is in Genesis, because that's another place where God breathed on man. And, and what happened there is, is God had shaped man and then now breathes life into him, yeah? And so we can look at that passage of scripture to see what God's intention for man was before sin, um, what the idea of peace that Christ is talking about actually looks like uh, that is being referred to in our scripture today. Um, and so you can read about the creation of, uh, the account of creation in Genesis later, but what I'd want to do is just maybe list a few things that I noticed in that passage to give us a better understanding of peace. And what we'll do with that list is we'll have the opposite side of, of that list to show us what a picture of not having peace looks like. Again, so that we can have a proper idea, a proper definition of what the peace, the peace that Christ speaks of looks like. So I have, I have six, six items. Um, it's by no means exhaustive, but again, the point is to give us an idea. So the first thing that man and, 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 and woman had when God had created them uh, before their fall was fellowship with God. So Adam and Eve were able to talk with God physically and interact with him physically. They would walk with him, they would talk with him, they could see him, uh, and so on and so forth. There were no limitations in the interaction. Um, so they could approach God as however they would want to. The second thing that they had was a clear purpose. So both Adam and Eve knew why they were created. They knew why they were in the garden. Um, they had been, it had been communicated to both of them why they were there. They didn't question it, they weren't unclear about it, and they did it diligently, um, and they carried out that purpose well. 
The third thing was unashamedness and intimacy. So Adam and Eve was the very first marriage. And if you're ever wondering about marriage, that is the first marriage to ever to, 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 to look at. Um, and there was nothing in between them. They held nothing back from each other. There were no secrets between them. Um, they were naked before each other and they weren't ashamed. Now the nakedness that's being referred to is not just nakedness in terms of physical nakedness. It's nakedness in terms of their emotions, in terms of their mental state, in terms of their psychology. Everything, there was nothing, absolutely nothing between the two of them. Yeah. The fourth thing is there was complete reliance on God. So they would look to God to know what to do. They would look to God to know about everything. What is right and wrong, they didn't define for themselves. It was God who would tell them, this is what you should do. This is where you should be, you know, this is where you should be going. Um, again, even tying back to their purpose, God communicated that to them. They didn't make it up on their own. Um, they did nothing apart from God. The fifth thing is there was no lack of anything. At no point did, before they sinned did Adam and Eve lack anything. They were completely satisfied. Uh, it was even, even for the sake, for in, in terms of Eve being created, it was God who mentioned to, it was God who decided that it's not good for Adam to be alone. Adam didn't complain. And so God is the one who brought Eve, Eve, Eve to, to, to Adam. And you can even look at what the snake tempted them with. He tempted them with to be tempted by. And then the lastly, the, the, the sixth thing I see is all of creation being good. Every time you notice God made anything, he said it was good. So all of nature existed well. There was nothing out of order. Everything worked well together. Um, and so just, just to re-emphasize that list again, um, again for those who may be taking notes, and then also so that we can compare what the opposite of these things are, is first, fellowship with God. Two, a clear purpose. Three, unashamedness and intimacy. Four, complete reliance on God. Five, not lacking anything. And six, all of creation being good. Okay. So these things give us a picture of what peace with God looks like, what the peace that Christ is referring to, it look, um, what, what that picture looks like. So that in itself may not fully give us an idea of what that peace is. Maybe we're starting to get a picture, but not fully. So I want us to look at the opposite of those things, um, because some of these things, I think, are the reality of our lives today, um, to now get even a much clearer picture. And as we go through the opposite of this list, one of the things I'd want us to, I'd want to encourage us is just to self-reflect and look at your life personally and see, do any of these things resonate with you? Do any of these things you know, hit home very close to you? Yeah. So remembering our list, the first thing we would have that is the opposite is no fellowship with God or limited fellowship with God. So even for those who are saved nowadays, we cannot interact with God the way Adam and Eve did. We cannot see him physically. We cannot you know, talk with him physically, even hearing God. I, I think one of the questions we keep on asking is, how do I hear God? How do I hear God? How does his voice sound like? Does he speak in, in a dream? Does he speak, you know, how? How does it happen? Um, and so we struggle to hear, to hear him, but even more than that, we struggle to know whether it is even him who is speaking. So beyond even just that physical interaction, I mean, think about how hard it is to concentrate on God's things. There are so many voices, so many things around us. There is your career, your family, your friends, your status. There's so many things around us that speak so much louder than the voice of God. Even our own emotions and our own wisdom and our own intelligence, they tend to speak much louder than God, and we have to put in so much effort just to hear God. So that's the first thing. Second thing is no clear purpose or a struggle to know our purpose. You know, you think about how we have so much anxiety, so much worry about tomorrow or about the future. Why is that? It's because either it could be a possibility of, of I think, three things. It's either we, we don't know how our future should go, or we don't know how tomorrow will, will turn out, or we, do know how our future, we think we do know how our future will turn out, or we think we know how our future should go, but we don't have the tools or the resources to accomplish that, that future. Or thirdly, we do know what our future should be, uh, we do know what tomorrow looks like. We do have the tools and the resources to achieve that future that we want, but we get that future and it actually isn't all that we hoped that it would be. So clearly there's a struggle to know our purpose. There's, a, there's an issue, there's something that's not right. Nothing is actually enough or it's not what we actually wanted. The third thing is we have so much shame and relationships amongst us are broken. So this is one of the things that sin does. It, it brings about shame. So we go about lives with so much shame. I mean, think about how many secrets that we hold close in our hearts that we would want no one else to know. 
Um, and we try to cover them up with inadequate things. Now, in the garden, what they try to do is cover it up with fig leaves. But we, in our day and age today, what we, what we try and cover it up with things like our career, our status, our beauty, our money, um, our network. You know, all these kind of things that are inadequate, and they, we try to cover up this shamefulness that we feel inside, um, and it's never enough. It's actually never enough. It doesn't do what we hope that it would do. Um, the other thing about relationships is we look at how amongst us as human beings, our relationships are broken. And even among marriages, we struggle. I mean, things like, I mean, there's these very common things, especially among young people, it's, you know, my money is my money. So I go into a relationship and it's, I'm keeping, you know, I'm keeping my independence. I want my independence. Um, and this person is only there maybe to fulfill a certain need that I may have. So, and, and even beyond marriage, you look at the friends that we have. We only have friends who benefit us. Either they benefit us emotionally or financially, and we discard anyone else who does not give any value to us. Um, another thing, another um, saying that we have as young people is your, your network is your net worth. You know, so you only keep or certain people around you. You don't keep anyone who adds no value or who brings your status down. The fifth thing is nothing is ever enough. Um, we, we chase after so many things, uh, and we are constantly searching and, and looking for things to fulfill us. Uh, and there's always this idea that if I just get this thing or that thing, you know, if, I, if my, my relationships go a certain way, if I just get this salary, if I just get that career, uh, you know, if I, get, if I marry this person, if my children are this way or if my parents are that way, then, you know, things will be okay. And we just keep on chasing, keep on chasing. At no point in our lives are we, are we rested like, okay, it, I'm fine, I'm okay. There's nothing else I need. Um, so nothing ever actually fulfills us. Then the last thing is creation is, is actually broken because of our sin. So we look at how our planet is. I think a lot of us now are aware of the reality of global warming. And a lot of this is caused by our, our choices as human beings. You know, you see how weather patterns have changed completely. Um, there's extreme weather, there's extreme heat, there's extreme floods. It's because of our sin and the choices that we have made. And so the, our sin not only affects us as human beings, it affects even our planet. There's sickness, there's decay in not just us, but our planet as well because of our sin. And so this is what a, least, a lack of peace results in. Um, and let maybe let me just, uh, again, because I, I repeated the first list, let me repeat the second list as well. For again, for those of us who are taking notes, is one, no fellowship with God or limited fellowship with God. Uh, two is no clear purpose or struggle to know our purpose. Three is we have so much shame and relationships amongst us are broken. Four is we rely on ourselves and, and others or other things but not on God. Five, nothing is ever enough for us. And six, creation is broken because of our sin. So, you know, as, as we're going through this list, I, I wonder if some of these things resonate with you. If, if you look at these things and you're like, actually I have some or, not, or, maybe, or maybe all of these things in my life. Um, and again, all of these things are because of sins. And, and it's not just other people's sin. It's not just Adam and Eve's sin. It's your sin and my sin. We contribute as well to this state. And this, and this is what actually Christ came to deal with. The result of this sin, the result of this lack of peace is, is death, eternal separation from God. And this is what Christ needed to come and deal with. So when he's talking about peace, this is what he's referring to. The Bible teaches that we are naturally enemies of God. Um, and so what the peace that Christ is talking about is peace with God. So Christ came primarily to die for our sins. And that's important to note because it, it affects how our approach to Christ is. He did not necessarily come to give us better careers or more stable families or, you know, to achieve your vision. He came to give you peace with God. Okay. So then, what does it look like? The second point, what does it look like to seek peace with God? So John gives us the picture of, of Mary. Um, what's interesting about John's account of Mary is the other gospel writers point, uh, talk about how there was a group of women who went to the tomb, to, 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 to Jesus' to Jesus's tomb. But John focuses on Mary. Um, he details her interaction with Jesus and draws us to that draws our attention to the very personal relationship between the two of them. So just a bit of a background on Mary is, Mary was among a group of people who had had demons cast out of her. And specifically, she had had seven demons cast out of her. And from then on, she had been one of Jesus' followers. 
So she had already had her life turned around massively by this Jesus. And, and maybe just to pause there and, and think through some of these things. You, you know, one of the reasons I think we are not so sold out for Jesus as Mary was is because we have a very high opinion of ourselves. We, we think we are very good people or we think we are okay. So we don't see a need for a savior. I mean, how can someone save you from something that you're not struggling with? Um, and think about some of the philosophies or the things that we hold in our heart that we think are true. How many of us actually think we are bad people or evil people? I, you know, I, I don't think many of us do. Um, so we think, I'm not really a bad person. We compare ourselves to other people so that we have a standard of righteousness that we think is okay. So I'm not as bad and so, as so and so. You know, I'm much better. If I was to put up, you know, if you were to put up um, on one hand Hitler and on one hand me, it's like, of course, I'm, as, I'm not as bad as Hitler. He's much worse. He's much more evil. And yet the Bible points out how we are all, we are all evil. We are all sinners. Um, and so we don't see ourselves as lost. Now, what's interesting in the Bible is the number seven represents completeness. So for the Bible to record that Mary had seven demons, it's a state of how completely lost and completely hopeless that she was. Yani, this was a woman who there was like, she's gone. She's completely gone. Um, there's no, no hope at all for her. She's just in a state of it's despair. It's, there's nothing. So, of course, when Jesus comes and frees her from that bondage, it's not a challenge for her to give her life over to Jesus. It's not. Because, I mean, here he's a man who has given her dignity when she had none. Here is a man who has, who has lifted her up. Here is a teacher, a friend, who has given her life when she had none at all to speak of. And so, of course, Mary in turn gives her life over to him. She's so sold out for Jesus. Do you notice how even when she, she's, she's meeting angels, she's not shaken? And other interactions of angels, with the, other, other appearances of angels in the Bible generally, people are trembling, they are fearful. The other gospel writers even record how at this, this time, there was earthquakes. But for Mary, that's, that's of no concern to her. All she cares about is, where is my savior's body? That's all that's on her mind, nothing else, absolutely nothing else. And, and, and even Jesus meets her, in, in a way that, that's quite personal and quite friendly, yeah? Now remember, for Mary, Jesus is her teacher, her friend. And so how does Jesus reveal himself to her? He doesn't come with a sign and, you know, doing, you know, splitting rocks and making the earth open and he pops out. You know, he's not levitating and, you know, saying, I am God with lights behind him and a halo and music and, no. All he does is call her by her name. And that's what drives recognition in her. It's, it's quite a point of how a relationship with Christ is so personal. Because it's, very, it's a very personal gesture. It's, 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 uh, um, Jesus calls her as one friend calls another. And I think some, one of the things we struggle with is, is how our, our walk and our relationship with, with, with Jesus is. It's not necessarily about you know, going to church or Bible study or you know, all this or serving in ministry. These things are wonderful. But the heart of it is, is a very personal, friendly relationship with Jesus. And, and look at the benefit of what, what Mary was able to gain as a result of this relationship. Um, she was the first person to see Jesus resurrected. Secondly, she was the first person to be comforted. When everyone else is grieving, she's the very first person to be comforted, like, my savior is alive. Look, he's alive. And so I think the question I would, I would throw to us, throw back to us, including myself, is who is Jesus to you? Is he actually your savior who rescued you from your sinfulness, you and me from our sinfulness? Or is he merely a means to get what it is that you actually want? Is he the final treasure? Or is he, you know, again, just a, a kind of like an ATM card, like, God, I want a career, I want a job, I want a this, I want that, I want that. And so he's there to provide it for you. And we'll explore this in the next point a, a bit more. But um, as we linger on this point just a bit more is to seek the peace that Christ offers. First of all is to know and be able to admit that I am actually a sinner who does not deserve God's love, who does not deserve God's grace. And it's to not make excuses because a lot of the times we make excuses for our sinfulness. You know, we blame our parents, we blame our children, we blame the country. We blame so many other things apart from, you know, I, by the way, I'm the one who actually sinned. 
And the beauty of it is once we get to that place of being able to admit that by the way I'm actually a sinner, that's when Christ meets us. That's when he gives us um, not only a peace that we actually need, he gives it at the right time. Yes. Jesus didn't come to die again so that we would necessarily have a more comfortable life. He didn't come to die so that you would achieve your vision of what you think your life should go, go uh, how your life should go. But these, and, and these smaller visions, they, they tend to come and cloud our minds. They tend to come and, and come in and, and take our focus away from Christ. They tend to be distractions from God's larger, much greater picture of what salvation is. Now, the peace that God offers does eventually come and distill down even into these things before us that seem so great. Uh, but again, they are quite they're, they're distractions, and they take our focus away from, from, from God. And so the disciples as well had the wrong picture of what, of what Jesus came to do. They were more concerned with their own vision. Um, they were more concerned with their own idea, their own agenda of what he was on earth to do. And interestingly, he told them time and time again why he was on earth, what he was going to do, but they didn't get it. It didn't click in their minds. Um, for them, they were too wrapped up in their own vision. And to get an idea of what this vision is, um, we can look at what happened on Jesus, when Jesus had resurrected and he was on the road to Emmaus. He meets two disciples, and they are, uh, they are sad. They are sad because this Jesus who they, they believed in, who, this Jesus who they looked to, did not um, free them from Roman oppression. So for the disciples, what Jesus had come to do was to save them from the Roman oppression. Jesus had come to give Israel freedom, and that was his purpose, that was his point for them. And they weren't concerned about sin, that was what they were concerned about. And partly because of that, they then missed, of course, Christ's greater working of what he was, he was, he was on earth to do. And for them, it was Israel's freedom. But even for us, we do have things that are right in front of us that are so important to us. And think about the idols that we have. Think about the things that you're like, if, if only this thing goes well, then you know everything will be OK. Um, think about, is it your career, maybe, again? Um, I, I think I'm, 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 I'm keeping on talking about career because I think that, for me, is what's right in front of me. Is it your family, the state of your family, either your children your fam your, or your parents? Is it your beauty? Is it your status? Are those things so important to you? Is it your finances? Um, are they so important to you that they become idols and they, they, they hide from you Christ's greater work, what he actually came on earth to do? And sometimes, interestingly, actually, Christ may frustrate even those things that we think are so important because they do take us away from God's actual plan and what he actually is intending to do. For God, his plan is eternity with him. And if, if, if your life here, if you having comfort here, will take you away from eternity with him, then he will not allow you to be comfortable here. God prioritizes eternity with him over this life. And that can be hard for us to accept sometimes because for us, we have a limited vision and we are so focused on this life here and now. And so maybe, are you, are you aware of some of these idols? Are you actually alert to, but these are actually idols I have in my life? Um, and we all have them. And on top of that, do we see how they distract us from, from God's plan? Think about the prayers we make. How often are we praying for, God, give me a job. God, give me a husband. God, give me a wife. God, do make my children this way. God, make my parents this way. How often are we thinking about these things or praying about them? It's, a, it's an indicator of where our hearts really are. And do you see, again, on top of that, how we tend to use God to get these things that we actually want? Because our hearts are there. They're not with God. They're with, with, with these things. And so we tend to use God to get these things. Something maybe to make us, I don't, I don't know if it, this will make us a bit more, uh, give us a bit of despair or not, but you realize that Jesus didn't free Israel from Roman oppression in his time. In fact, he didn't talk much about Roman oppression while he was on earth. He talked about other things apart from that. And so for the disciples, if they had continued to hold on to that vision of we need to be free from, from this, this oppression, they would have missed the greater work of what God was doing. And secondly, we would not be here today because they would have not shared the gospel and spread it, and we would not have been able to receive it. So I think a challenge on that point for us is, is one, to realize these lesser visions that we have, and that we would be willing to exchange them for the greater joy, the greater vision, the greater working of salvation. 
God's much larger and much better plan. The last point is, is that peace with God can only come from God. So how do you get this peace? So we've talked about what this peace is. We've looked at how a picture of seeking this peace is. We've looked at how there are distractions to keeping us from this peace. But how could you actually be sold out for Jesus? You know, how do you get, let go of the things that are right in front of you um, and let Christ rule over you? Are there 10 steps maybe to be a better Christian? And you know, the, the, the sad, well, I don't think it's sad, but I think the reality is that we are unable to do this on our own. There's no special steps, there's no special book. Apart from the Bible, there's no book per se, and even the Bible, you have to put in the effort to read it. Um, there's no mountain to climb. There's no special anointing that will make you saved or make you a better Christian. We simply cannot save ourselves. Yeah? Um, and looking at how the disciples were, you, we, can kind of, we, can see, we can kind of start to see that. So he's the one who appeared to the disciples. They were not out looking for him. They were actually in hiding because they were more fearful of other things. Um, they did not understand what Christ was talking about all the time that they had been with him. He is the one who breathes life into them. He is this one, he's the one who takes this group of weak people and transforms them and uses them so mightily and so powerfully. Again, we have our salvation because Christ used this group of people to share the gospel and to spread it. And, and Christ breathing on the disciples is them receiving the Holy Spirit. It's them receiving new life. They were dead before, but then they had the Spirit of God in them. And similarly, even for us, um, we receive God himself, and he's the one who changes us. He's the one who transforms us. He's the one who gives us understanding because we have the actual spirit of God within us. We not, just get, we not only get peace when we are saved, we also get God's spirit right within us. He gives this to us. He, he implants that vision of what he's working towards, what he's doing, and gives us understanding of that mighty, powerful vision. He did it not just for the disciples, but he also offers it to us as well. We are not saved because we read the Bible and we reasoned out that, you know, this actually makes sense. Uh, we are not saved because we went to a certain group of schools, or maybe we are more exposed than other people and we know how the world works and all these kind of things. We are not smarter or brighter than others. And, and these things mean nothing in God's economy of salvation. Just look at the group that he uses. He uses people who are so weak and fearful, um, who are so wrapped up in their own things. And you see how they are, if you read through Acts, you see how they are then used so mightily and so powerfully. And it's true, the, the picture that should, 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 should be implanted in our minds is how we do not bring anything to the table. It is God who saves us. It is God who draws us to himself. Um, it is all about him and not about me. For me, it is to receive the finished work that he has done. It's not to add anything to it. And how wonderful when he is the one who can call us and can draw us in to himself. And so today, I think especially on this Easter Sunday, Christ is calling us, is calling you and me to give your lives to him. So for those who are not saved, to actually come and give your life to him. But if you are, sin, if you are saved, it's to do away with the distractions. It's to do away with maybe the lesser visions that we have. It's to do away with the things that are so important in our minds and exchange them for the beautiful, wonderful gift of salvation. To let go of these things that we hold so dear, these idols that we hold so close to us. Because what, what is better than the peace that God offers? So again, if you are not saved, it's to turn from sin and turn to, towards him. And if you are saved, to let go of these distractions, of these lesser visions, and, 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 and give yourself over to him. To remember why he came. Again, he did not come to give us a comfortable life. He did not come to fulfill the vision that we have in our minds of how our lives should go. He came to give us peace with God. He came to give us peace that we actually need at the time that we actually need it. And so I'd, I'd want to encourage us again that we have access to the Spirit of God. And I'd want to encourage us that, that he is able to rule over us and lead our lives in the most magnificent, brilliant way possible. I want to encourage us that we have access to this peace that God offers. Thank you.
the, see, the sleepless savior <clears throat> becomes the radiant one, the one who gives us peace and breathes his life on us. Let me to invite the worship team to join me. I think one of the major reflections we have that I have from God's word today is do I have peace? Do I have peace? This morning. Do I have peace? First of all, peace within. Is the Spirit of God evident hovering in me? Despite circumstances of the nation, despite adversities in family. Can I sense the peace of God tangibly? Or is violence the preference? Are we living a life of war, a life of peacelessness? We do not know the Prince of Peace yet. Do you have fellowship with God this morning? And I know the other factors like, you know, marriages and family and work spaces, but could you permit me to just narrow down on, on the state of your well-being with the Lord? Because how sad it would be on this Resurrection Sunday that the risen Savior has no significance for you in your life today. The risen Savior has no room in your life today. As we gently sing the call to worship, I'd like to give us room to respond to the Lord. I'd like us to examine ourselves, both young and old, and see perhaps we left Jesus at some point in our lives and have lived life away from him but all is not hopeless all is not lost like Peter who had denied Jesus and Judas who had betrayed him yet it is only one who was left lingering to be restored to grace And so I invite you into a space of prayer, to a space of just reflecting, Father, Lord, do I have peace with you above all else? Do I have peace with you? Is your spirit in me or am I lacking? And perhaps if you feel like you would need to, to have someone stand with you in prayer, feel free to come. Take your glory, King of Kings. Take your glory, Lord of Lords. Take your glory, take your glory, King of Kings. It belongs to you. Take your glory, 
slow. Take your glory, take your glory, King of kings. It belongs to you. It belongs to you. Hallelujah. Ooh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. King of kings. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, take your glory, King of kings. It belongs to you. Can you imagine how sad it will be that one day the elect of God would be singing that song and you would not be found amongst them? Because the Spirit of God, the peace of God does not reign in you, you do not know the Lord Jesus. And so, be there anyone in our midst, young or old, who assesses their lives and says, Lord, I'd like to respond to you. I'd like to know your peace. Perhaps I don't know it. I don't know you, Lord Jesus, as I ought to. If you could lift your hand and put it down, we pray with you. If you'd like to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Or if you'd like to recommit your life to him. We can't speak of this Prince of Peace if you don't know him. Is there anyone who would like to give their lives or rededicate their life to the Lord? If you could lift your hand and put it back down, I, I would pray with you. Savior Jesus, we are grateful this Sunday morning. Having done all that you have done, now you reign enthroned victorious King of kings and Lord of lords. Having endured the shame of the cross, having endured the shame of our sin, having endured life as mankind in the broken world for the joy set before you you endured the cross 
and scorned its shame. And here we are, we can sing hallelujah. Hallelujah by faith on this side of life because your death and resurrection is so meaningful to us without which we would have no life to speak of both in this side of life and even in the next and so how we lift your name on high how we exalt you king of kings and lord of lords that you may take glory you may take preeminence in the name of jesus I ask for those of us who perhaps have strayed from the reality of your peace, from fellowship with you, intimacy with you, O oh Lord. A purpose of life from hearing you. Would you return us back to the fold of God where we can discern your voice and experience the Spirit of God? Yet perhaps some of us who have the wrong perception of life, that God, you exist for our needs, our wants, our desires. Remind us, Lord, that you are the creator. You are the giver of good gifts. Help us to treasure you beyond the blessings of God. And that you truly would be enough for us. And so receive all glory and praise and honor. And now over you, church, I pray that the peace of God truly would reign upon you, upon your minds, upon your hearts, upon all that you do, that the Spirit of God would govern you and lead you to paths of righteousness, even for the sake of God's name. I pray for, for restoration and revival from on high, that it would please God to allow you to experience His presence in such a tangible way, even this week. And now may the grace of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a beautiful week ahead. High schoolers, please, we are meeting. Wazazi wa high schoolers, musi wachukue tafadhali. Asante. Yeah.